So hello everyone. Uh, hello, and uh, I am Sachi Gurk, a PhD student under uh, Professor Jose Reno, and uh, I'm contributing towards an open source infrastructure uh, designed for live hardware development called LiveHD. And today we have a panel of UC Santa Barbara and UC Santa Cruz professors with award-winning contributions in the field of open source hardware. So uh, joining us via Zoom from UC Santa Barbara, we have uh, Dr. Jonathan Valtine, who is the lead architect of OpenPython and its descendant BYOC, that is Build Your Own Code, which are productive open source hardware research platforms with thousands of downloads from over 70 countries worldwide. And from UC Santa Cruz, we have Dr. Jose Reno, Dr. Matthew Guthas, and Dr. Dustin Richman, and Dr. Scott Beamer. So Professor Guthas is the creator of OpenRAM memory compiler and has interests in open source computer-aided design and modern design flows. And uh, Professor uh, Reno created Pyro, a modern hardware description language, and LiveHD to improve the productivity of hardware designs. Professor uh, Richman is an early contributor to PYNQ, which enables engineers who design embedded systems to using devices, uh, which uh, is an open source project that aims to work on any computing platform and operating system. And uh, Professor Beamer leads the Vertical Architectures, Memory, and Algorithms group and created Ascent, which is a high-performance RTL simulator. And he's also a major contributor to Chisel and Fertile. So the research of our panelists ranges from computer architecture to programming languages to ASIC design and agile and open source hardware design. Thank you all the professors for joining us today. So uh, let's start with the uh, some of the questions. So what is an interesting aspect of the research you are currently working towards and how does it relate to open source hardware? Anyone, maybe we can start with. Start with John, he's on the, on the screen. Okay. <laughs> the big imposing head, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yes. Great. Um, so we, we have a cool project uh, going on at the moment. One of our uh, graduate students is coming more from the programming languages side. Um, and we are trying to apply program synthesis uh, to the hardware design process. And so Zach's work, which he, uh, we had kind of a presentation at LATI uh, back at ASPLOS in the spring, um, is trying to take away some of the hard work that you have to do in designing your processors or accelerators and so on. Um, and so we make the argument that writing data paths is fun and you don't need to think as hard about it. It's quite you know easy to do in some sense. Uh, whereas writing control logic is a lot more fiddly because if you make small changes to your microarchitecture, changing your control logic can have more global uh, effects. And so uh, the idea is that we take just the data path of the design, the designer will just write the data path. And the uh, we feed this into a program synthesis tool alongside the ISA specification. Um, and the program synthesis tool actually generates as correct uh, control logic for the processor uh, upfront. And so it means that you can go in and make changes to your data path or make changes to your ISA spec and have the control logic generated for you automatically and have it be correct because you fed the, instruct the ISA specification into the design. And so we think this is a great fit for open source and agile hardware development where you're gonna be picking up somebody else's design and you might need to make modifications. You don't necessarily know all the details of how the control logic works um, and that you might be kind of iterating and iterating and adding new features, adding new optimizations. And we hope that this can enable more rapid iteration because you can just make the changes to the data path or the ISA spec, and then the control logic would be generated for you automatically. Great. So, and so maybe I'll go. So the thing I'm focusing on is mostly on how to make more productive hard workflows. And maybe the three main things is one has been a lot of work by Shang. He was been on paralyzing the flow so that you can go much faster. So it's a highly parallel work workflow. 
Uh, the other one, uh, such as working more, is like to provide feedback. If you do something like a synthesis, can it provide feedback on the source code, what's happening there? So to back annotate the source code and try to do parse iteration, not to just look at critical parts on that list. And the other one that we're trying to do is, uh, as we connect with this feedback, is try to get more power modeling on the flows because there are not so many on the open source flow community. You want to do a power model. There is a lot of things for synthesis, there is ABC or mock turtle, but there is not so much on getting power feedback to the designer. So those are the three main current focus, but anything under improved productivity or hardware design is sort of a fair game in our group. So I think the thing that I've been focusing on is um, kind of with abstraction, you have a lot of things that are dependent on the technology. So it's particularly when you get into analog design, memory design, things like this that are, it's hard to abstract away a lot of the details. And so trying to find the boundary of what you should abstract and also what you're willing to give up in that abstraction. Cause that's how everything is built, right? You're, to go one level up, you kind of have to make some assumptions and you hope that those are good assumptions to get you most of your performance, but you do give something up. And so trying to do that at the lower level with memories in particular is what I've been working on. And there's another group at Michigan that I think is really interesting where they're trying to do that with um, analog design as well. So trying to do kind of technology independent analog design. And of course it's important because all these systems are not just digital. Right. You need your sensor interfaces, your clocks with PLLs, things like that. And so trying to figure out how to abstract that stuff is what I I think is interesting. One problem. I guess I also can go down. Yeah, so uh, as you mentioned, one of the products in my group is this project called Essen, which is making a high-performance uh, hardware simulator. And it's been going on for years and very grateful for the student contributions. And uh, it's been a really fun project to really kind of think about what does it take to simulate hardware? What does hardware need? And then what is actually going on when a program runs on the actual host CPU, that hardware? And that could change the program run faster there. It's kind of a little meta problem of, okay, I'm thinking about hardware, then turning into software, then now I'm going to run on hardware. And how do I change the software in the middle and make it run fast? And this is some cool results. And we've actually uh, been very much accelerated by open source, right? So not only is our tool open source, but you know, designs we're using to evaluate and run this are open source designs. We built a lot of our code base on existing uh, open source packages and libraries. It's been very powerful. Um, I got the open source kind of a real catalyst for all that. That's probably a good transition to me. Um, a lot of my work is focusing on, like Matt talked about, abstractions and interfaces uh, from my graduate work and developing PCI Express interfaces um, to work at Pink. And then also what I'm working on now, which is um, sort of related to what Scott's working on, which is if we have users who want to develop hardware, how do we enable them to basically tinker more easily? Um, so right now I'm working on contributions to the base jump standard library that provides simulation interfaces that allow you to write test benches and write C code so that you can test your own hardware without having to, I'm sure all of us who are here have worked with hardware, try to write your own test benches from scratch. And you can use some of the work that we've been doing on the base jump library now. Thank you, everyone. So uh, before we move any further, how would we like to take any questions from the audience? Like they can interrupt in between? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah, you have a question, yeah. So please feel to work. OK. Mm -hmm. So one question to come back to the um, statements about power and analog. Can you give some idea about how the specifications or descriptions of those would differ from digital logic specifications? So on the power, it's the commercial flows are sort of there. So, the, but there is not in the open source flow so that we cannot evolve and explore. So it's mostly you have the very log design, whatever you create a synthesis at least so that you have the cells at the end. And then from there, what we are doing is we pick a tool external like open timer and we patch it in order to handle it better the power because it didn't handle power. Uh, it reads another standard library that is called Liberty. And then 
we create another BCD reader. So it's getting a lot of things from several places and some of them didn't have it. So we have a BCD reader, which is the activity rate. So now I have the activity rate, I have the power consumption from this other library, I get the thing from this other one, we put it all together and then it can get the power. Now we are reading spare files. That is a more detailed place on route information. So that is that it keeps adding more details and it's able to create that power trace as the thing executes. So in the industry, you can get those things, but and now we are sort of in the step of reproducing what you can do with the commercial tools. But if you want to start to now, I don't know, do AI to skip some phases or something, now you have a platform which you can change all those things. And you have a reference point. Well, if you are in a commercial environment, it will be very difficult. So you have an open source replacement for each step in the chain. Yes. With access to the source code, so you can change it. Because otherwise it's closed and you don't, you know, you can put input, output, and what happened there. Actually, one of the interesting things I think, Jose, on uh, the tooling that you're building, particularly when we're targeting these new open source uh, fabs, is that we're like, we have like awesome tooling that's 20 years more advanced than when, you know, the fab was brought up in the first place. And so we can do like so much more <laughs> with the technology that, the versus kind of the point that that technology came back on. I'm really excited about that aspect. I think, I think that's a benefit, but it's also a curse because a lot of the data you get from the 20 year old fab is assuming the 20 year old tools and they're now trying to like, you know, fit it into the current way we do things. But for example, some of the data that they've gotten in the Liberty files and the extraction decks, they're finding is not as accurate as it should have been. And so timing actually doesn't correspond to what they thought it would be. And they're actually trying to figure out why right now. Yeah, and, and for example, we're running the sky water and the gate level synthesis library that I have, I have to patch it by hand because I have issues. I couldn't run it. They have a specified things that very later doesn't read. So there are issues left and right that you have to keep addressing. But hopefully with the bigger community, we can push these things in a way. So uh, continuing on that note of 20 years then and now, uh, what do you guys think is the state of open hardware uh, tools today? And where do you think it is going to in the future? I think I'm the youngest person here, at least the newest faculty member for sure. Um, it's interesting to look back when I was in graduate school and see how much has changed in the last 10 years. Because when I started in graduate school, there really were, there were only open source simulators back in 2012-ish era. Um, and now today you can basically do any part of the flow in any FPGAs are ASIC uh, using open source tools. Now, granted, it's hard. It's not going to work every single time, but that's miles from where we were 10 years ago. In 10 years, I hope we're even closer you know, to where we want to be. It's easy for us to teach in a class on open source tools, which is something I'll be teaching later this year. Um, so I mean, just that we can come explore the tools together. But I hope that we can do all of our classes on open source tools and make it approachable. Yeah, I totally agree that has improved a lot. Like the, the culture too, because like 10, let's say 10 years ago, the culture of the EDA community is, I'm gonna patent this thing. I'm not gonna let it. So maybe I license the patent later and, and I'm not gonna release the code. And if I release it with a lot of restrictions, you only can use for academic points. And most of the time they were gonna release only the binary. Uh, so that culture has changed a lot in make a big difference. I would say the EDA community over the decades they have had a lot of contests like they've had like placement contests and routing contests and those have been interesting to kind of advance the state of the art but um, as you mentioned a lot of times some of the winners would just release a binary that runs on the benchmarks um, and then the other big issue with that was they were benchmarks like just placement benchmarks that don't consider routing or routing benchmarks that don't consider timing so we're now into the state where we have a full flow. You can actually see the effect of a change in placement on your power and your routing. I think that's that's the interesting thing is we have the every step in the flow, there is at least something now. It may not be good, but there's something, which that's mm -hmm. the first time we've been in that 
situation. So I think it will eventually be the 80 20 rule where we'll get like 80% of the way there. Then I'll see that we'll probably start to slow down. So that final 20% of getting a clean, bleeding, bleeding edge flow is going to take a lot of effort. But hopefully, we have users by then, you know, a lot of contributors. And yeah. I might also add, so I, I would be pretty optimistic about open source. Um, look at EDA. I mean, originally, now 30 years ago when it was kind of emerging open source universities and then it became commercialized closed source and right now it's kind of the pendulum is drifting the other way going back towards open source you compare that to other systems applications throughout computing this is a common pattern and once it goes open source the second time it doesn't come back right so uh writing proprietary os would be ludicrous now right you're gonna you're gonna fork linux right uh you're not gonna write proprietary compiler you're gonna take client and gcc right and so these were things that were, you know, academic projects decades ago. They became commercial. People paid money for compilers. It's hard to tell kids now that other things you paid money for compilers, but people used to do this back in the day. But no, now the source ones are unbeatable, right? And so I think what's going to happen for CAD is it's kind of in order to make the open source community win, which is starting to head that way, but it's not guaranteed yet, is democratization, right? More people building chip, more people using the tools. And I think we're kind of already seeing that, right? There's a push where for geopolitical reasons, people are building chips in more countries now. Uh, you have potential Moore's law slowdown. I don't know how much it's going to slow down, but in 20 years, some amount of slowdown. So if Moore's law does slow down, it does bring down costs. Once again, increasing when people can build chips, more democratized. So yeah, I, I would be pretty optimistic about 20 years from now, what chances we'd have for some amount of open source uh, tooling, both comparing the set of trends to working on technology, as well as just looking at things like compilers or OSs and how they were open source, went closed source, then went open a second time, and then they never turned back. Oh. Any thoughts on that, Tonkin? I think one of the interesting things that happened recently was one of the FPGA companies basically said, we're just going to do an open source flow from now on. You know, they, uh, I forget who it was. Uh, That's right. Lattice. Uh, Lattice. Yeah. Was it Lattice? Yeah. They were like, you know, Yosis is really good for synthesis and our tool, we've got multiple engineers who have to, you know, maintain this thing and keep the quality up and so on. And I think, you know, as the tools get better and better, there's going to be a lot more people who are willing to invest that little bit of expertise you know, that they would that they would otherwise just keep in house to make a shared infrastructure better. Um, you know, you hear stories from people talking about an improvement that's made in LLVM, you know, and it helps everybody who uses LLVM, right? And I heard some story about Google uh, updating LLVM and getting a one or two percent performance uplift for their entire fleet and you know trace it down and it's just some you know some grad student somewhere had like landed their patch right i hope that's the way that we're going to go with things and like if we can have i think both the breadth of being able to support more use cases combined with like just in a few key places people contributing the best technology straight out of universities uh that's really going to supercharge things and make it possible to to push forward um yeah I'd actually like to amplify something that Jonathan said. So I, my background is an FPGA developer, and Lattice was one of the is still probably the only company that really supports people tinkering with their flow. And I think it's really critical to have companies buy into what Lattice is doing, open sourcing their tools, saying it's okay if you break our bitstream because you know at the end of the day, you know, you're gonna make our tool better and more more prolific. And he when I came for my visit, uh, handed me in a Lattice FPGA, and you're like, hey, you can stick this in your computer. And, that's that's perfect. That's what we need. I have a few more if people want one. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, mean, I, think I think we had a, a Zalan speaker come to this very symposium in a prior year talking about rapid rights. Yes. Yeah. Chris. Um, Chris, exactly. What's his last name? I don't remember it was Chris, but I can remember his last name. I think the one thing we're not looking at, though, in the open source community is one value that the commercial CAD companies have is not only the software, but they actually have a dedicated engineering team and, a, and an application engineer, which customers pay them a lot of money. So there's literally an employee that's on site and they're like, hey, this doesn't work, fix it. We don't have that in open source and it's gonna, open source kind of flips out in the end. If you're a designer and something doesn't work, you're gonna be responsible for going and patching the tool yourself. That, that's gonna be an issue. Wasn't, wasn't that the Red Hat model? Yeah, I mean, that we might get more support companies. That's, that's yeah, a you can have a consulting company who has the open source and then you get those consulting. It's the same with Linux now. So you are in a company, usually you you are bringing up your hardware, you need to 
during when you get the silicon, you have to get one of those companies who work on Linux and they help you bring up Linux, which is open source, but you are contracting those persons for a few months until you bring up the, the hardware. I think they can do that. The thing that is unclear for me, if you are doing bleeding edge, the fabs up to now, they have been very secretive. And before the release, they know there is a lot of interruptions with synopsis of cadence to get the flow ready. So you are bleeding it. I'm not so sure how happy the fabs are going to be doing that interaction. But, but I think we are still far from the bleeding edge technology. Well, 20 years from now, what fraction of chips will be, you know, bleeding edge processes versus the other processes that are still highly capable, right? It'll be a lot more economical, right? Yeah, but maybe at the time bleeding edge is going 3D or how do you call the power? Is this the package substrate? How do you handle the things? They still have EDA tools there. So they're still bleeding edge. I, otherwise, it means that there is no more progress. Well, no, I, <laughs> on I, the, no. I think it'll be bleeding edge. The question is just how much does that need to be? So if open source be widely acceptable, right, across the world, right? You need it to be applicable. If you have, you know, very much proprietary niche things for a certain vendor, that's not necessarily be as easy to incorporate. But the point is that, you know, like even today, for example, like how you do TSMC versus Intel or Samsung bleeding process, they're very specialized, right? But like how you do a 45 nanometer, it's going to be specialized to the fab, but there's some commonality that's starting to get a little more well understood, right? Um, well, this is similar in the FPGA area where the lattice FPGAs are not bleeding edge because they're kind of low power. You look at the highest end Xilinx stuff, you can't use that with open source tools. So, but for example, I was talking to the people, I, I uh, speak, no, the, the ones who do the nice FPGAs, Speedtronics or something like that. No, I forgot the company, but internally they use ABC for the synthesis and they maintain with the with the team in Berkeley, but they don't open source the patches and might do some little feedback to the team in Berkeley, but they use ABC on the synthesis flow. So they use pieces of the open source in their commercial flow. I think or one of them used VPR for place and route, which is an open source. Mm -hmm. So I like what Scott said about um, costs as well. Like with the open source tools, there'll, there'll be even more, if the open source tools target older nodes, there'll be even more reason to use those older nodes because there was a paper by my postdoc advisor that talked about when you're getting up to speed on an ASIC flow, it's more economically feasible for you to go after 45 nanometer because it doesn't cost as much. And now if you don't have to pay for the tooling, which is $100,000 a seat or something. Um, yeah, it, it sounds ridiculous, but that's what you pay. Um, with the open source tools, there'd be no reason not to go for, for a 45 nanometer tape out before you start doing something seven, five, two, whatever they come up with next. Yeah. Just a quick clarification. I mean, a lot of the discussion here was on ASIC design. I think someone mentioned EDA. Can you say more about the tools for, I don't know, uh, you know, other electronics design, which right now is a little bit fragmented in packaging. You, you can get a, a circuit designer and then you have to patch in your, your simulator in a different way. Is there any incentive for open source community to kind of package these things more efficiently for, for people? So I, from my perspective, I think that one, one of the key things there is adoption, right? Like if you want to see your tool adopted, you need to make it easy to use. Um, this was one of the big focuses uh, that we had when we were building OpenPython was you need to be able to do all the tasks that you want to do by just running one command, right? Make a push button as much as possible. And that can go as far as like sending a thousand jobs into a cluster to go and run something. But I think that's a big reason for uh, people to to go and put that effort in, right? It's like you're not going to get the adoption unless you make the stuff you need to use. And usually that's just going to come about because some poor PhD student is having to do the grind of connecting all those tools together and making things work well. And they now realize that, hey, I can actually open source this and help other people out. Um, so I, I think that's going to be one of the big drivers. Great. So, uh... Any comments on what we can do to increase interest and participation for the more in the open source hardware field? And mainly what can we do to make hardware more approachable to students? Maybe we can start with uh, Professor Lucas. Um, I think my big thing is accessibility. So actually I just hosted a workshop for the National Science Foundation on how to do, this is one of the problems we've talked about is how to make, how to get more people interested in this and so on. And, the answer was accessibility, which open source tools help that, right? 
but um but that's only part of the problem i think another part of the problem is also um curriculum having having curricula available to teach that stuff um, right now we're seeing kind of proliferation of just like videos that people record live and post and it's not very well organized and i think that's kind of the missing thing it's like having some sort of quality check to make sure that people are learning the right things and the correct things um which i don't know how that will happen yet so. for sarah yeah for some sarah sort of course era but it has to be kind of a wiki model too of like people updating things and like because if you as soon as you make something these tools are changing so rapidly it's out of date so it's um we have to have updated curriculum and yeah it has to be like direct like, well directed yeah and i think curricula across all the levels too like not just college but think about in k through 12 what do people learn about chip design in k through 12 nothing do they even know what a chip is? Maybe. Um, you know, we need something at that level to kind of get people thinking about, you know, what enables all these AI things. Well, you need a special processor that does something. So what is a processor? I think it hasn't trickled down in the, to that level yet. I think that might happen once the tools are more open source. We're seeing people do um, like chip design in, in notebooks, like online, where you can literally do layout and stuff in a single notebook and have it make a design. So that makes it accessible to someone that doesn't even have a Linux box, right? They just have a web browser. So I think that's a first step. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one thing interesting in, in Boset that we are gonna have soon is the open source workshop. There is a high school student who submit a paper have done a tape out. And it's been doing with uh, the open source flow project. And we're going to get feedback what how he did it and why. Uh, but clearly, he is not going to understand all the details of place and route and everything. But because the tools are open source, they are there on the community. There are some guys, even at high school, you know, was able to push the flow, which uh, which is the first time I've seen that. Uh, clearly, it's an outlier, but it means that it makes those things possible. If you were having cadence synopsis, it would be impossible. How can you get the site license for that? Um, I think right. the documentation of those things will get pushed, it will go through, but I still not there. Yeah, I would want to elaborate on that point because absolutely right, accessibility is kind of a key issue. Kind of an interesting anecdote. So in grad school, my colleagues uh, were doing RIS-5 and one thing we did not anticipate when we put RIS-5 out there was there'd be a large pre architecture hobbyist community, which we never thought of. This was our, our day job of pre architecture, who we were grad students studying and There were people who had other uh, jobs and they was just interested and they actually were doing it at night for fun and oh i'm doing it for fun let's check out this new essay oh this new essay was five let's check out risk five and so they were all these hobbyist cores hobbyist blog posts hobbyist videos and it was kind of realized you can think much broader than just okay what's a student doing in a you know bachelor's master's phd degree for computer engineering right there's a lot more hard to find out though people would be interested in this how can make it accessible so as matt mentioned open sourcing tools print curriculum online having that content be available if you're not required to be a student at a four-year school instead you can be you know just browse on the web and find something. Uh, once again, putting things in notebooks so that way you can just easily get it online, you know, you install tools. Those are all really helpful things. But I think we can also push in more directions, also pushing in terms of what does it mean to design harder, right? Does it doesn't mean you have to write Verilog or does it mean you can uh, do something cool for Arduino, right? Do some cool maker and you'll think, oh, that's, that's still harder. You're still hacking, you're still making, right? That's really cool. So kind of broadening the application to try and make a bigger tent and what's going would be really fun. Yeah, I, th I think like, the, the other piece that's pretty necessary is just like robustness of the tooling, right? Like back to Matt's earlier point about abstractions, right? Like, I mean, if you're using GCC and it doesn't work, right? You can Google the error message and somebody's like, encountered, you know, there's a hundred, hundred results in Google of like people encountering the same error message and you're probably going to get an idea of where you need to go, right? If you're the high schooler and you hit the problem and you're treating the, the design flow as an opaque thing because you don't know what's going on inside it, you know, the tools need to be sufficiently robust that you can just go and, you know, flip an option and have a, a simpler path that's still going to get you to, to chip on the other side, right? And I, I think that's going to be one of the important things to make it possible for other people to, to use this stuff, getting the abstractions right so that you can be more robust and vice versa. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Um, 
people have already said things I was going to say. I actually like uh, Matt's comment about trying to get the education of some of the chip design stuff in K through 12. There's really no reason we couldn't be teaching some of the concepts about state machines and Boolean logic in K through 12. That's stuff that, you know, taken a different light. That's basically high school algebra or geometry. So, so uh, not just academia, but uh, in industry, we have seen that uh, there are specific tools, specific vendors that are generally uh, used, like Synopsys and Cadence tools are, are all over for hardware design. And we have uh, such a good force uh, for open source hardware community, uh, such amazing projects. But still, uh, the open source hardware projects are not used industrially commercially. So what we as the open source hardware community lacking that we cannot really reach industry yet. I'll take a stab at that one. Um, so Linux is great. All of us are citing Linux here a lot, but behind Linux there is 100, 200 engineers that are actually involved in it more, more or less full time. And some of that is through the Linux Foundation. So I think sort of what we need is a hardware community is something that is our Linux foundation. There's drawbacks to Linux foundation, but something that's going to be there to nurture and support the community that has money that doesn't have, you know, a vested interest in a particular company. And maybe those are the ones that go off and tell any number of the vendors that we've mentioned today, you know, oh yeah, you know, this tool, it works like this, you know, we'll, we'll and do this, in a sense, do the lobbying that we as a community need to do at those companies, uh, but also get the resources from say Google, I'm sure Google probably would fund something like this. I don't know if open source foundation exists and we could help you to rebut. Yeah, I was going to volunteer. Yeah, so this is starting to happen, right? So I think you look at open source adoption for hardware and industry, it's happening more at the front end side, you know, the design, simulation, verification side. The back end, there are open source tools, but because as Jose mentioned, they're using, you know, bleeding edge ASIC technologies, it's harder to make those tools align with those. But for the front end, there's two major efforts. There's the Chipped Alliance and the Open Hardware Group. Um, and yeah, I don't know the last headcount of Chipped Alliance. That might be on the order of 100 engineers. The Chipped Alliance uh, is a number of companies, uh, including Sci-5, Google, et cetera, Western Digital. Yeah, so they're pulling together engineers uh, to support open source products. Some of their headliners are things like Verilator, Chisel. These are all the kind of main things in there. And that's, that's promising. The Open Hardware Group, I believe, is technically centered in Canada, but it's quite international. Um, it also has industrial and university participation to do a lot of cool things. And so I think we're starting to get that. I think the front end first is more likely because we don't have to worry about the details of what happens with you know four nanometer geometries and the crazy proprietary details there. But I mean, it's encouraging. It's starting to happen, I think. Um, and we're actually a member of Chips Alliance. Oh, great. Um, well, I, I, should, Alliance. I should get you guys to go. <laughs> yeah, I've been at yeah, we are We are members of Open Hardware Group. Uh, they're easy as being. Yeah, I think there's, there's, already, there's already foundation starting, right? So if, if we're heading in the right direction, I think. Yeah, at this point, I think the only thing we need is time. <laughs> like, that, that's the answer, I think, is give it a year or two. Then I, I will say more than a decade. <laughs> <laughs> there's several startup companies doing it, right? Well, it depends from, um, because what happened, my take on the, if you are the chip fabrication, you get a 5% difference. That's very important when you start to do a lot of high volume chips. And we're very far from that 5% difference with the open source flow. Yeah, I mean, I mean, even if we were targeting 28 nanometers, we are very far from that 5%. On the performance model and those things, maybe faster, maybe slower, but you can tolerate as a scale up machines. It's different that I fabricate the chip and I'm buying to that. So I think we, hopefully we get there, but I think we're still many years away. I think with the current, investment if the, all the chip sack stuff goes through i think we're going to see it accelerate in the next few years yes but even if the money comes now we hire the phd student it doesn't go until the next year <laughs> yeah so it's like five years until it graduates but, but there's a big component that's not academia that will be faster than that yeah a lot of the chip sack money is going to uh, dod and contractors that might be using some of this stuff too mm -hmm. so no, clearly there is a moment. Go. No, I was saying that clearly there is a moment momentum for that. I was just going to give one uh, a couple of concrete points, which uh, people are still kind of uh, 
a bit annoyed about. One of them is uh, system verlog support. It's getting better. It's not all there. So if you've got you know more advanced system verlog designs, it's hard for you to run through some of these flows. Um, and another thing is kind of more reverse engineering for some of the commercial higher end FPGAs. You know that's stuff that like you get the right person in and they sit down and they do some fuzzing and they figure out how the internals work for some of these FPGAs. Um, you know then we're able to target kind of more and more advanced FPGAs as alternatives to uh, having to use the commercial flow and. The progress that's been made by the people who sat down and tried to get some of that reverse engineering effort done was always quite rapid. I don't know if we can promise that in the ultra scale plus multi SLR, all this additional stuff, but there's still some features that are kind of missing there that need uh, extra love. Um, and that's one thing I would really like to see, because I think being able to use open source flows for the FPGAs the whole way, I think would be awesome. We So on that note, do you think that we uh, were all working as small communities on different projects, but towards a common goal. But if we standardize and if we work as a single large community, then uh, we'll be faster and we'll be able to achieve a standardized open source software. Or you think it's better to work independently like we are doing right now, and it will lead to a diverse ecosystem and more research. Can I go first? Yeah. <laughs> so, so I think that our model right now where we're letting many flowers bloom is the right model to follow. It, we might go a little bit slower in some places, but we're learning things and sharing things. Like one of the, you know, we, so we've been working on a project for improving RTL simulation speeds. And we've been working on that for a bit and we hit some roadblock at some point. And then our students sat down and read Scott's paper and was like, Ascent tells us exactly why we're having the problem that we're having. And if we, you know, turn around the problem this way, like we can now do really big RTL simulations. If we'd all been focused on one tool, you would miss out on some of these opportunities to get the bread. And, you know, the, this is the beauty of the open source bizarre model, right? Um, I think that there's core technologies that we need to gather around and standardize. And I think Jose has some cool ones going in that direction, particularly. Um, but, you know, that we should be thinking about a broad tent. I'm actually kind of worried about Linux in some ways because we're really, really, really uh, starting to focus down on one operating system kernel, right? And that's going to have its downsides. In the past, we used to have a lot of different kernels available and you could kind of maybe mix and match your runtime in your kernel, uh, sorry, user space in your kernel. And I do worry a little bit about us consolidating all uh, onto one technology. In my case, I sort of agree with you. And uh, the reason is because the programming industry, they have very compartmentalized on the, I do place, I do route, I do this. And our community has been very in that way. And, and in my case, I want to mix the things together to do much faster iteration. So if we compartmentalize, I say, oh, I have to use this place and route from this group, then it really constrains the way that you do things. So I really like to have the, many the alternative approach and then let them fight off and the problem is that our community is smaller than what is in software so in, in the this on the software community you have gcc and clang mostly uh, you have to compare it, but the communities are huge if we have in synthesis we have abc and mock turtle and it makes sense but if we're having like five or six of those it will be difficult to justify because our community is much smaller. Uh, so clearly there is a community problem there. Yes, and Jose's comment. I think it's wonderful to have a broad ecosystem, but I think we need to communicate. As John said, like we need, we need to take, have some sort of method or group or meeting or conference where we all get together and say, oh yeah, I have this problem. And somebody else is like, oh, I solved that problem. Maybe it was a different tool. Maybe it was a different, just completely different paradigm or part of the flow. We need to be able to communicate so that we can get those ideas, those sort of boundary crossing ideas into other tools. And that will make our community seem a little, hopefully a little bit bigger. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, to make that more concrete, right? I mean, I think that everyone agrees diversity projects is great. The fear would be you're you know, spreading your talent or your efforts. But I think we don't need to artificially constrain that. I think that happens naturally in a field where as the state gets more, field gets more mature and the tools get bigger. It just kind of happens, right? Linux is so big that like, it's so hard to imagine competing with it because it's just so big, right? Uh, and so I think 
the thinning out will happen naturally. We don't need to do anything to accelerate that. I think the important thing kind of dealing with uh, Dustin's saying is standard interfaces, right? So the reason why you can use tool A versus tool B and change about much friction is because they both support the same interface, right? And so I think that'll be a good idea if you figure out, okay, even though we know we're gonna have different tools, different approaches, as long as at various points in the flow, and so as they brought out, you know, I can change between my placer and my router can change tools because they both support the same file formats. Kind of having these, you know, de facto standards or actual standards could help. I think there's also the issue of not just file formats, but of uh, memory APIs for in-memory stuff, which is important. Like we see that with a lot of the backend design. Like you use your own database format, and then there's OpenDB, which is another database format, and everyone that writes their own tool does their own thing, which it's limiting. You can't do interface through files with a lot of these things because they're just too slow um, for any sort of design. And so I think there, there, do need, there do need to be some standards in there that people use, which it's not, they're not defined. They're not, it's not clear what the winners are yet. Mm -hmm. so. Or there will be, it could be multiple winners. Or multiple winners, yeah. Small design and a big design one is different. Yeah. So maybe we need to come to some common grounds like having does that mean that having some standardization in the form of uh, constraining which tools we propagate <clears throat> or uh, having some standardization like because if you don't do that it's going to take definitely more time for reaching some goal that we have this standardization for other things starts with a consortium of companies usually right and so we're academics talking about standardization. I mean, do we have to get, will it naturally happen when start companies start using this stuff more? Or I don't know, it's kind of an open question. You have a big lever, which is you're educating the, yeah. the workforce. It's a little bit early to say there's one standard, but yeah. if, if you thought something was the wave of the future, I mean, that's what we yeah. see with open sources people who go in the workforce can't imagine working at their job without these open source uh, alternatives, right? And so they bring that in. So yeah. that, that's another way to it. Because risk five is an example where yeah, I mean, we're, we're all starting to be like, this is what people should learn. <laughs> the, the, the risk five foundation was founded by someone walking half a block or a couple blocks off campus and opening a mail office box at a FedEx store, right? That's how the foundation was officially started at a mailing address, right? So yeah, I mean, you can, you can do stuff like that. Um, I mean, at the end of the day, it's what's it going to do, right? So the foundation, we had to have something official because at that point, we were already a company saying, we're set risk five. We want to give you money to make sure you guys can handle the small things that come up. And so we had to have a mailing address and that kind of stuff, right? So we actually had to incorporate. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think it's all quite doable, right? Um, hardware, there's just so many different aspects, right? Because when we say hardware, it's the entire world, right? So you're talking about the right in your RTL, that all stuff pushes through hardware design. There's, of course, other world the maker space and so there's many different standards kind of out there right but things like arduino is kind of like a very successful de facto standard right and so maybe you don't need to have a foundation you just do it and then see who joins in yeah i think that the other piece about like connecting to the industrial tools already exist you know it makes the standardization problem harder right like we've got uh, as another mentioned like people who are using the open source tools for the front end, and then they're using the commercial tools for the back end. And if you need to be able to switch between those, then you end up standardizing on the things that industry likes already. And maybe that's not the right solution for us, right? And I, I think that's an open question as to how to like push forward on the standardization and, and demonstrate that our standards are better than the ones that industry is using and trying and pushing them. I think in the open source FPGA side, they've had some emerging success in terms of the uh, bitstream formatting stuff. They have this like FASM uh, project for, for FPGA bitstreams. Um, so I think that's it's going to be a really tough thing to, to trade back and forth with industry on. Because at the moment, it's like, you know, you use Liberty and you use Verilog and, and those things. So uh, moving on, what do you see as the biggest strategic opportunities for open source hardware to grow? Getting money from the Chips Act. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> There's so much money in that. Yeah, I think yeah, yeah. I think ongoing support, like the way a lot of these projects are supported, is you have a grant 
for research and as a side you have kind of the open source but there isn't continuing money to support those projects that's actually something we recommended the national science foundation is have you know support grants for projects i think this was even mentioned a little bit uh in yesterday's session for this uh, symposium where about you know exactly that there's a transition from research prototype to maintained open source project there's a lot of support required and i, yeah, I think if chips that can be the you know bootstrap to get that going that's really important um when i was in grad school at uh, berkeley they had the good fortune of having generous enough grants they could basically hire full-time engineers to do support for us right and so as students would be able to kind of focus on research and there were veteran engineers who had you know 30 years experience who were worrying about uh ci and that kind of stuff and so that was a really nice arrangement that was kind of I would argue a good use of the luxuries they had, um, but we need to make that available to everybody. I've gone through a project where I've done this basically field engineer work for two years, not with my first open source project. But that's I agree completely. It's like you need somebody there to to take it from a research idea and make it usable and sustainable long term, and that takes money. It takes a lot of time. Go ahead, John. Sorry, I interrupted you. No, 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 no don't worry. Um, you probably spoke minutes before I did. Uh, so I, one of the big things I think and I'm really excited about right now is we're about to have a Moore's law for open source fabs, right? Like fab after fab has the potential to open up. I mean, provided they don't close the old ones. Um, and that's just going to really accelerate the capabilities of what we can actually go out there and build versus what we could do before. Um, and we, yeah, we, we, need to ride that wave, right? And and be coming along and making stuff that works in all of these fabs as they come along. I think there is a big question. I'm still not quite sure how you decide to open a fab up that you uh, opened more recently than 18 years ago, because uh, surely you're probably worried about revealing that you actually violated your competitor's patent for 18 years. Um, but I'm hopeful that we're going to continue to see more nodes. It sounds like, you know, we've got 90 recently and it sounds like 65 or 45 might happen. Um, but that's the fabs problem, not our problem. I mean, I imagine the fabs open sourcing is a business decision, right? They decided, you know, we've been open long enough. We've amortized our original CapEx. And by open sourcing, we can increase our market and thus our demand and sell more product, right? So I think as long as we can create a, even somewhere that continues to happen, they'll continue to open source these fabs, I think. Yeah, the question is just, uh, will they get past the lawyers when the lawyers say, well, <laughs> are we sure that nobody can sue us for 18 years of profits, uh, you know, for violation of some patent that you know, could, could exist? So one, I hope they get past the lawyers. <laughs> one more recent thing that came up is export control. And actually, if some of this stuff can be used to create munitions if it's beyond a certain performance then you can't make it open source and so <clears throat> there are some i haven't read it there's been some recent stuff on that yeah there, there's some legislation in the past even back in the 90s i think this due for a uh revisiting to the numbers as you can imagine are not great uh some of those things to find uh you know sensitive tools i think design something capable of a gigaflop or more and so oh man a gigaflop oh too too powerful right and so Never mind, you probably have maybe 100 on your watch now, but uh, right now it's a very high performance computer, right? So some of these numbers need to be revisited for sure. You need an inflation metric for <laughs> the computing. Any comments, Jose? Yeah, no, I think where it's an opportunity, the chip cycle is short term, then we have to figure out some way how to maintain those things. And it's the hope for the chip cycle. Still not there. We'll see how it goes. But then, I think it can create the, the burst, but then you need the not so much money, but longer term view money to maintain those breakers. Otherwise, they will die. Like there was the, a lot of things on the book bookshelf that they did a lot on the tarp on the that was the late 80s. That's the, the SRC, the Semiconductor Research yeah. Corporation, funded a lot of yeah, benchmarking and standard file formats between layers of abstractions with benchmarks and tools for each of them. And, it had funding for a while and then it stopped. <laughs> so I just thought of one more possibility. Uh, uh, FPGAs in the cloud, right? I mean, a lot of cloud software is already open source. 
We're seeing more adoption of FPGAs in the cloud. Perhaps that's an opportunity for people to start sharing their cloud FPGA designs. That's another way to kind of push the tools more. Uh, I, I don't know AMD, but talking to Intel, there are not much on that idea. Even the design team is like, why would you be open source? Well, so so the, there's, the, there's the tools from the FPGA vendor, and those may stay yeah. closed for a while from Xilinx and formerly Altera. But then there's the actual designs being used at either Amazon or Microsoft, right? Like the IP you're putting on FPGAs, right? You know, what if you're somebody that has spent a lot of time building this and you open source it and you want to run on both FPGA provided by Microsoft or FPGA provided by Amazon, you're going to try to open source and commonize some of those things, right? The IP side. Okay. There's been some push to commonize the IPs that you can switch between the artist formerly known as Altera and the artist formerly known as Xilinx <laughs> um, interchangeably on most of the major things like, you know, PLLs, the ARM cores, actually more than people expect. Um, the PCI Express interfaces, from my experience, you know, there are certain large IPs that you are relatively well standardized. That's what I heard, right? I mean, so Cloud PJ may not be an opportunity. Luis Vega from uh, University of Washington recently set up a startup called Sabana, and that's the, the business model that they're following. They're trying to make it easier to share this FPGA-based IP and provide, you know, they'll provide their own kind of front end into that, that if you target it, then uh, you should be able to roll your stuff out in the cloud really easily. It's worth checking out. Mm -hmm. Alex, I'll start with you. Any ending thoughts from professors? Maybe. So one thing that it's, we'll see, but uh, the challenges, one of the challenges, I'm not so sure all these you know, politics around export controls are gonna harm some other things. I'm not so sure how, how did they manage that during the Cold War period? uh how were they doing with the open source flows at the time i don't know but it, it is clearly there is an interesting challenge there guys you just sorry, actually talked about the one thing i probably know about in here because my last job was dealing with export controls in the cold war and in recent times i think with the, what i saw with open source and this was a few years back before i started across but um open source was kind of something that because it, a lot of tell, dealt with um more basic research to begin with um, that's uh, it, it automatically exempt. So generally speaking, things that are open source, because it's open, they can't be controlled because they're already out there. And that's kind of, it's that, you know, chicken and egg thing. So a lot of times open source things are just assumed exempt from the export controls. And then back in, I didn't, I think back in the Cold War, there wasn't as much open source on things that were considered <laughs> Um, there was no open source. All the stuff that was controlled was because it was defensive related and it was mainly country, you know, very, uh, you know, it was it was something that wasn't out there even in the industry very much. So um, I think that, so it's a different, it's, it's interesting now. And I think I, I like the point you were making. Again, perked me up. I'm like, oh, export control, something <laughs> I didn't know about. But um, I think that's, yeah, I think it's, I think it's moving forward. It can still be an issue. And it, I definitely from a compliance perspective, it's not something for professors. There's a lot of horror stories out there. Um, for professors who ignored, but that's normally folks who have like worked with DARPA or something like that. And that's when you know. And there's great, there's a great uh, open, uh, there's great export control support here on campus. Uh, Lisa Costaletti at the open, at, at, the, at the Office of Research is a great person to talk to. And I'm sure UC Santa Barbara has the same thing. So anyways, that's my open, that's my export control plug. Yeah, I mean, I think within the last few weeks, there was some headlines about access to gate all around transistor technology. Like if you were doing a place and route tool that targeted that kind of technology, you wouldn't be allowed to export that to China essentially. Yeah. Since we're doing parting thoughts, I see seven people watching us virtually. So I'm assuming this is recorded. If anybody's interested in this, is interested in working with us, if you just mention open source, we'll happily respond to your emails. We want more people to work with yeah. us. I might also add, so uh, here at Santa Cruz, we have something called the HSC or Horror Systems Collective, it's kind of this umbrella organization. Um, so one of the things we do is we have uh, weekly seminars. And so this week we canceled because of the cross symposium. We want to support that, but we're having that next week. Um, and we actually have recordings on our website. And I believe we have both Jonathan Balkan and his colleague, Tim Sherwood on there. And they were happy to have those guests. And so, yeah, so if you're interested, you can come check it out. It's hsc.ucsc.edu. And I don't know, 
You might have a similar summary you want to pitch, Jonathan. <laughs> No, no, at the moment, but the HSC seminar was a great, great part to participate in. I was really glad to do that. And yeah, I mean, I've looked across a bunch of the talks and they're, they're awesome. Uh, it's really great perspectives from a wide variety of people who are doing the work here that matters. Um, one, one thing I'll, I'll mention is uh, in spring, we should be having an open source uh, silicon conference called Latch Up uh, here at UCSB. Oh, um, and so I encourage you to come down to Santa Barbara and uh, join us for that and come and present on open source silicon work you might be doing. Okay. So I we went to latch up at the first one in Portland. In Portland, yeah. You know, latch so up Portland. when are you doing it? Uh, it should be in spring, sometime around spring break. Okay. Um, yeah, we'll, yeah. That sounds great. Let's send the dates. Contact we'll, us. We'll send a bus. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you should put it in Tahoe over spring break or something. Then we'd really go. <laughs> Uh, that'll be fun. That'll be fun. Like that, that conference was very fun, and that actually started a lot of my connections that I've had in the last couple of years. So, yeah, it was a real shame that we didn't keep doing it after that first one because there was a whole pandemic. We, going. <laughs> we were actually going to be a sponsor for it the next year at MIT, and then it got canceled. So, yeah, yeah, yeah UCSC was a sponsor. But what happened in March 2020? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Any final thoughts or questions from audience? Okay, great. Thank you so much to all the professors for being here and for talking with us. It has been really enlightening. So, thank you, everyone. I will just, just to obey, you're, you're waking up a little early, but um, feel free to, if you want to sit around a little bit, there's still some coffee and pastries outside, um, unless people have taking them away since I walked in here. Um, and the lunch technically starts at 12.30, but I think they're going to be set up a little early, so I'd probably be head down at 12.20 or still. And everyone who was here participating was invited to that. So you should have enough. Doing a head, quick head count, I think we're safe. <laughs> so, you forgot to register. All right, great. Thank you so much. Thank you.